Thank you everyone for attending this virtual tutorial on PBS job submission and um, hopefully if you're new to Archer, uh, this will give you some idea of, of how this, the system works. But actually if you're already an Archer user, I think some of this stuff isn't obvious, but I said please, please type in um, uh, any uh, questions you have as we go along. So uh, all the materials on a commercial commons um, share alike, non-commercial license. I said the PDFs will go up on the web uh, shortly after this talk is finished. So what I've tried to do is um, try and make the, uh, rather than do my normal boring slides, to try and make the uh, talk a little more interested, I've tried to illustrate a day in the life of a PBS job. I'm trying to follow the various um, uh, uh, stages that a PBS job goes through, at least on Archer. So first of all, it's sort of, um, uh, you, you, you write a back script with a, with a text editor, and we'll cover uh, what that means. You then submit the job to PBS batch system using QSub. We'll have a few examples there. The job is held in a queue until it's able to run, and the way that's done is fairly standard, but maybe slightly different on Archer from what you, uh, you might be used to on a local cluster. Then it's executed. And that's the bit where it's maybe not quite, it's not immediately obvious on Archer what's going on there. Uh, then the, the job, the parallel jobs are launched from the script, and this is actually the, um, the, the slight subtlety. What you actually submit to PBS is a, a batch script, a, a batch job, and we'll cover what that is. But actually launching parallel jobs from that, from that batch script is a separate, um, a separate operation, and we'll cover how that works, and that's where some of the subtleties come in. Then it's completed and job output written. There's also your charge at that point. I'll cover a bit about charging. So this is sort of birth. Your batch script is written, and then uh, all the way to cradle to grave. Um, so I'll just cover these in turn, but please, please type in some any questions. So first of all, from conception, you're gonna you're gonna create your batch script. Um, what is a batch script? Well, what you do is you just a batch script is just a, a list of commands that are executed in order, exactly as if you typed them into the shell on the command line. And so basically, you know, you, you don't have an interactive shell when you launch a batch job. That's what it's got a batch system. You can't type stuff into a uh, into a console, but you just put everything you 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 wanted to type into a script, and um, and that's executed. And we recommend that you use bash. Now, normally, lines starting with hash are comments, but there are, are two exceptions you need to know about um, uh, on on Arch. So one is a standard one, uh, hash then exclamation mark is special to the operating system, and we'll see how, how that's used. Uh, well, the classic one is hash exclamation, mark, hash exclamation mark bin bash minus minus login. You should put this at the top of all your batch scripts, and this says run this script as if it's a bash login shell. So you'll be able to use bash syntax and such like. I have to say, I, I think the default shell is bash. Um, there is some technicalities to why you need minus minus login, but if you if you hash exclamation mark slash bin slash bash minus minus login at the top of all your scripts and everything will work fine. The, the slight um, the, the slight subtlety is that you can actually pass options to PBS, and hash PBS is a special comment. A hash PBS is special to the batch system. So, for example, you can you can pass batch system options. So for example, if I wanted to name my job, I don't want it to appear with a default name, but I want to call it my job. So when I do a queue stat, when I look at the queues, it, 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 uh, it, it's got a sensible name. I do hash PBS minus capital N my job. And although that looks like a, 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 a comment because it begins with a hash, because it begins with hash PBS, it's, it's, recommend, it's, um, it's recognized by PBS. But other than that, uh, a batch, the batch script you submit um, to PBS is just like a standard uh, normal script. So that looks great. If it's a normal script, I can run the batch script in advance and check it works. It's very annoying if you submit a batch script, you wait 10 hours for it to run, and there's a typo in it. So you think, well, I can just should I just execute it locally to check it works? Well, it's not that simple. Why? Well, you might your batch script runs on a different computer in a different environment, and we'll cover how that works on a couple of slides time. So you might think, OK, some commands that work on the login nodes won't work on the PBS. I said, so I'll be able to, you might think, well, I can run something when I'm logged in, it will work. And when, I, when, I, when it runs on the PBS, it's maybe more restrictive and some things will fail. Well, actually, it's not that. It, the, the problem is actually some commands that don't work on the login nodes will work on the PBS. And the problem is that the, obviously what you want to do from a back script is, is to launch a parallel job. And that's done on the Cray using a command called ap run. 
And it's kind of unfortunate that you cannot do that from the login nodes. You cannot run a parallel job, at least an MPI parallel job, on the login nodes. So that actually means it's quite difficult to debug your scripts because the most important part, which is the run the parallel job, uh, won't work on the login nodes. Now, you can, you can comment that out and test all the other stuff if you have pre and post processing, but that is a slight issue. And we'll maybe come back to how you can, we can at least try and circumvent that later on. So that's a bit annoying, but we'll come back to that. So what happens there is you, you then submit your job to the bank system with QSub. And a classic thing would be to QSub minus L select equals six my job dot PBS. Now just to go back, um, okay, so um, what happens at this stage is that PBS then takes a copy of your batch script. So that's quite important to know. It may not be obvious, but a copy is taken of your batch script um, so, and stores it somewhere. So you can then edit your batch script again. Well, we'll cover to whether that's sensible or not, but, but a copy of the batch script is, is taken. And then PBS will ascertain the resource requirements. And you can pass options to PBS in two different ways. You can do the minus L. So you can do minus L, so L um, select equals six, which says you want six nodes, and we'll come back to that. Or you could do minus L wall time equals um, three hours and zero minutes and zero seconds. But all these are valid hash PBS lines. So for example, when we had that hash PBS minus N my job, we could stop Q sub minus N my job. So hash PBS specifies some PBS option in the script and it's kind of hardwired, which could be good or bad. Uh, minus L allows you to specify it on the, um, sorry, uh, you could also specify them as options to, uh, to Q sub. So the classic ones you want to specify are select, uh, which selects the number of Archer nodes, and you, the only thing you have to know there is an Archer node has got 24 cores, or the wall time, and that would select the wall time of, uh, of three hours. As I said, you can use you can use the, um, uh, the minus, uh, you can specify the option on the command line, or you can specify the option using the hash PBS um, special line to the script. At that point, your job is queued until the resources are available. Uh, but you can you can do a, a QSTAT to check your job status. Um, by default, on Archer, QSTAT gives you the status of all the jobs, which is actually a bit annoying. So if you do QSTAT minus U, my username, then you will um, you will see all your jobs, and they will probably set the job status of Q to say they're queued. So at that point, a copy of your back script is is in the um, is, is is in the the, Q, the PBS system. Now, um, the way it works on Archer, I mean, you may have used systems where at submit time you select queues. You say you want to select to a, a queue for one hour jobs, two hour jobs, jobs with this, jobs with that. That's not really the way Archer works. Archer, you, you, you basically submit all jobs to a single queue. There are some special queues I'll cover at the end, but most regular jobs go to a single queue. And the job is scheduled based entirely on what you request. So what happens is they're all, all the jobs are sitting effectively in a single queue, and regularly PBS trawls that list and looks at what you've requested. That's fundamentally how much time you've requested, and how, much, how many nodes you've requested, how many 24 core nodes you've requested, and decides whether or not it can run your job. And it actually does something fairly naive. It just loops through um, the entire list of jobs. And that can take several minutes. So when you queue sub a job, even if the resources are free on the machine, it may take a few minutes to run, simply because it takes PBS a few minutes to trawl the entire job queue and, and check them all. The only thing which is um, which you might expect to be um, can, um, selected by a different queue, but isn't is the big memory nodes. Um, a couple of the boxes of Archer have have twice the memory of the other boxes, and if you want to run on those nodes, you have to do um, a slightly magic syntax: select equals six colon big mem equals true. So if you wanted six high memory nodes, you'd have to do that. But other than that, everything else is done. Um, um, well, everything goes into a single queue, and you only specify the runtime and how many nodes you require. So you might say, "Great, PBS has taken a copy of my byte script. If I want to, if I want to um, submit another job, I just edit the script and resubmit it." Well, it's not that simple because you're probably running an executable. Your batch script probably CDs to some directory and then runs that executable. Of course. It will run the executable, which happens to be there when the script runs, which could be in five or six hours' time. So um, the the thing you have to be very careful uh, when you um, resubmit 
what you often think is you, you compile a program, you submit the bad script to run that program, then you recompile the program and submit another bad script. You have to realize that the, that, that the executable that is run is the one which just happens to be there when your job script actually executes. So you need to be very careful. You're probably running an executable from the script and it will see the version that's there at runtime. It's OK if you're using a package. If you're using some centrally installed package, obviously it's not going to change. But if you're doing compile, submit, compile, submit, you have to be very careful to do that in separate directories. Otherwise, you'll be end up running, you know, uh, not not running the, the excuse you, th you think you were. And that may sound like a very trivial observation, but it's very easy to forget that. Um, how to decide when to run my job? Well, basically, it is a balance of a requested number of nodes and the runtime compared to all the other jobs in the system. So, you know, if if there's a if there's a gap in the machine that there's six nodes free for the time you requested, it will run them. If there's a really big job comes in, what it might do is it might do something called backfilling. Well, what it will do is it will, it will, it will reserve a big chunk of the machine. Um, um, say, say you submit a really big job, it might reserve a big chunk of the machine and start to drain that in, in preparation for, your, for, for the big job. But other small jobs might come in. It might, it might be trying to drain this um, section for a very big job. But if a small job comes in, it will run it, but only if it fits into the time window. So it's very important that um, we'll come back to this how you in terms of how you're charged. But when you, when you submit a job, it's quite important that you um, you, you specify sensible runtime because if you specify a massive runtime, if you think your job is going to run for an hour and you specify a 24-hour runtime, PBS will take you at your word and if it sees a gap that lasts for an hour or two hours, it's not going to run your job because it says, well, this person needs 24 hours. So um, you have to be, um, you should take care when specifying your requirements. Clearly, the number of nodes is, you know, the number of nodes is the number of nodes, that's the number of cores you need, but don't ask for huge amounts of runtime if you don't need it. So eventually, you know, you've submitted this job, you've requested six nodes for uh, three hours, say, um, then um, the, the, the PBS will identify some, some, some part of the machine uh, which is free for you and allocate your six nodes. So a set of compute nodes is reserved for your job. So at that point, um, your job is tied up with these compute nodes. PBS says, right, here's six compute nodes. You wanted six of them, and they're tied together. And your byte script then runs, and, and, and at the point it runs, you've been allocated the, these resources, these six compute nodes. And you might ask where it runs. Well, there's two obvious places you might think your batch script runs. You might think it runs on the login nodes, which is perfectly rational, but it doesn't. On a lot of cluster systems, it might run on one of the compute nodes. So on a lot of systems, what will happen is PBS might say, well, I've, I've found six compute nodes. I'll nominate one of them randomly as the master, which is where your script runs. The thing which is slightly confusing about Archer is that your back scripts run on nodes called the mom nodes, which are neither the login nodes, which of which there are maybe a dozen or so, or the compute nodes of which there are 5,000. Um, and um, this, the, they're called the mom nodes, a backronym for machine-oriented mini-server, but they're, they're called mom nodes because they mother and look after your job. And I'll come back to how they fit into the system later on. Once your, your job is running, the status is set to R. So the, the important point to, to note is that the only, your, your, your batch job is running on these mom nodes, which are, which are not the login nodes, which is the main, the main machine. How do you run a job on the login nodes, the only, on, on the compute nodes, sorry, the only way to run a job on the compute nodes, the only way to run a parallel job is to use AP run. So you might think that AP run just runs doesn't do much, but AP Run actually does quite a lot, and I'll come back to what AP Run does in the in the in, in the future. But if if your script has no AP Run commands, then it cannot be running anything on these compute nodes. It will just be running on the mom on the mom nodes. You won't be making use of them. So, you know, if you have a batch job which doesn't have an AP Run in it, you have to be worried. However, what a standard thing would be: uh, submit the job minus L select equals six, and then I. Um, I know that each node has 24 cores, so I do AP run minus N144, which is six times 24 in my MPI program to make sure that all the, all the cores are used. And it's up to you to tie up those two, um, those two numbers. Once PBS allocates you the, um, the compute nodes, it just goes away and says, right, you've got them for two hours. Do with them what you like. If you don't use them, that's your fault. And so the fact that the 144 number of cores was, was 24 times the six nodes, you have to make sure that they match up, which is slightly awkward. 
So this is how um, the operating systems work. We have the login nodes, which is where you log into. We have the compute nodes, which is where your big parallel jobs run. But somewhere in the middle of these mom nodes. And how does the operating system work? Well, the login nodes, uh, you log in, obviously, from your laptop, which will be running um, Linux or, 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 or a, a, a Windows, or, or might be running, you might be running from a Mac. The login nodes run a compute fat version of Linux, fully featured version of Linux, as do the mom nodes. But the compute nodes run a stripped down version of Linux called Compute Node Linux. And that's why I think uh, it's set up like this. Um, it would be, um, you probably don't want your batch jobs to run on the login nodes. You want some, some dedicated resources for them to run. You want them to be able to, not to be affected by other users. But if you ran on the compute nodes on Archer, you would have a very restricted um, um, operating system. And typically, although your, your, your parallel job, your MPI program, probably needs only a subset of Linux commands, open a few files, read and write them, send some messages, your batch script might be doing a whole bunch of stuff to do with pre and post processing and general housekeeping. So you want your batch job to run on somewhere which has a fully configured Linux operating system. That means on Archer, they can't run on the compute nodes. Um, and so what they do is they run on, on, on the, these things called mom nodes, of which there are, I don't know, half a dozen, four or five, that kind of number. So they sit somewhere between the login nodes and the compute nodes. How does the job flow work? Well, you SSH into the login nodes. The login nodes, you issued your queue sub, and your job is queued by PBS, which is running running somewhere. I don't actually quite know where PBS itself runs. At some point, uh, PBS identifies these six compute nodes that you've reserved. And at that point, you'll, it decides that they're ready. So OK, so, so you've submitted your job. You've requested six nodes. PBS has identified six compute nodes. Um, uh, for your use. At that point, your job is run and automatically linked to these compute nodes. But the only way you can use them is by executing AP run. So I said, um, there's a complete, there's, there's a complete dis disconnect between the resources you request, which is the Q sub um, parameters, uh, minus L select, and the, the use of them, which is up to you to make sure your, your, your job uses them. And using them means two things, A, issuing AP run, but B, issuing AP run with the correct number of cores. And we'll come back to that. The reason that I'm sort of maybe over this slightly is the confusing thing is how the file systems work. So I've gone from conception to childhood, now adulthood. You're running a parallel job. The compute nodes are reserved for the duration of your job. PBS says it doesn't care if how you use them. All commands on your back script are executed on the mom nodes. But AP run on the mom node causes parallel jobs to run on the compute node. So um, we recommend that you do production runs in slash work, not in slash home. Well, you have to. So you have to do production runs in slash work. So the classic error in PBS on Archie is to submit a job from the uh, home file system, which is where you, you log into um, by default, and then it will fail. And the reason it will fail is I'll cover on the next direct on the on the next slide. But what almost all your PBS jobs to do is they should cd to dollar PBS O work to, which is a slightly strange environment variable. But it's it's where the job was submitted from. So what we recommend you do is when you run jobs, you you work in your slash work system slash work slash project name slash project name slash username, and you you q sub um, your PBS job. Unfortunately, your PBS job by default starts running in your home directory, but you want to CD back to where you were from slash work. So CD dollar PBSO work there um, goes back to where you started from. When you do an AP run, which is where you run a parallel job, AP run does two things. It broadcasts the executable to all the compute nodes, so it takes a copy of the executable and sends it off to all the compute nodes. But it also gathers the standard outputs and errors from all the, from all the, um, the PEs, that's the create terminology, process elements from the compute nodes. So it, 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 it takes all the output, all the standard output and standard error, funnels it down and, and, and makes it produce, uh, and, and funnels it into the, um, the output file, the .o file you get at the end. So the reason that you have to understand really where the, well, it's useful to understand where the mom nodes sit is the file systems. When you log into the login nodes, you can see both the work directory, uh, sorry, the work directory is seen by the login nodes and the mom nodes. Okay. However, and, and the work directory is seen by the compute nodes. So if you're on the login nodes or the mom nodes, you can see both um, um, 
sorry, I'm not, I'm not explaining this very well. Come back. Right. Um, there are two file systems on Archer, slash home and slash work. Slash home is relatively small. It's where you should do your bookkeeping, your, your file system, general day-to-day -day management, and it's fully backed up. Slash work is for production runs. It's much, much bigger. It's five petabytes, I think. It's high performance parallel file system. It's not backed up. So you should do your development in slash home, and you should run in slash work. The login nodes, the mom nodes, and the compute nodes can all see slash work. So that allows you to do bookkeeping and general file system management on the login nodes, bookkeeping and general file system management from the mom nodes, which is where your batch script runs. You want to copy files, delete files, obviously you want to see the work directory. And the compute nodes, the reason I've drawn a fat link there is the compute nodes um, have very fast access to the work nodes to allow you to do fast parallel I.O. The login nodes can see your home file system. The mom nodes can see your home file system, but the compute nodes cannot see your home file system. So what happens is, if you don't do this CD dollar PBSO work, and if you don't submit from the work directory, your, um, your, your job starts running in your home directory. Uh, when you do an AP run, then the, the, um, the spawned, uh, your MPI processes uh, running on the compute nodes aren't able to see your home file system. That may be slightly confusing, but the way to, um, um, to get around it is always to submit um, parallel jobs from the work file system. So um, retirement, your job finishes after all the commands of the script have been executed or the war clock time limit is exceeded. Um, when your war clock time is reached, all parallel jobs are killed. So as I said, if you think your um, your MPI is, job is going to run for an hour, uh, you shouldn't say that the, the run time is going to be 24 hours because then TBS will wait for that big slot um, uh, and your job will, will wait a long time in the queue. However, if you have a, a job you expect to run for an hour, you shouldn't say it's going to run for an hour and a minute because maybe it takes a bit longer, maybe the file system's a bit slow, maybe your program's just a bit slower than you thought it was going to be, and they will be hard killed at that limit. So all jobs are hard killed at the war clock limit and you're charged um, for that time. Um, standard outputs are collated written to something like myjob.o job name, and that collation from all the, the multiple compute nodes or MPI processes to the single file is done via is done by the AP run command. And at this point, if you do a QStat, um, eventually if you do a QStat, you will not see your job. So if you do QStat minus U username and you see no jobs, it means they've all completed. However, you may see an E state, and E does not mean error, it's unfortunate. E means exiting, not exited. For reasons which are not immediately clear to me, um, jobs which have completed can still uh, sit around and, and use the resources for a couple of minutes, a small amount of time. So if you do a Q stat, Immediately after your parallel, your job is finished, it may say E, which is exiting, which means that it's in a tidy up phase, and that can take a couple of minutes. Uh, the reason I mention it is that a lot of people think that E means error, and it doesn't. It means ex or that it means exited. It doesn't. It means exiting. To all intents and purposes, the job has finished. All your output files will be complete. Um, you will be able to see everything, but PBS is just doing a bit of tidy up, and it can take a couple of minutes um, to do that. Charging, how you charge? Well, you're charged the number of nodes you requested, whether or not you used them. So again, PBS doesn't say, oh, well, you know, this person requested six nodes, but you only used one. You're charged for all the nodes you request, because while, you requ while they're allocated to your job, nobody else can use them. So, so, so you, 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 you've bought them, OK? You've bought them. If you don't use them, that's kind of your, your problem. Um, the minimum allocation is a node, and it's reserved exclusively, exclusively for a single user to try and get more pr predictable run times, which is one of the, the main design aims of the whole Cray XC system. Um, that's why there's very stripped down Linux on the, on the compute nodes to try and make things predictable and reproducible in terms of performance. Uh, we don't, you never share a node with another user. So the minimum allocation is a node. Um, the classic error, which I've been asked to point out, because this has happened a few times recently, is you do hash PBS minus L select equals 32, that asks for 32 nodes. 
where a node is 24 cores. Then you do AP RAM minus N32. On some systems and on all CRACE systems, you requested at submit time the number of MPI processes or the number of cores you wanted. On Archer, you don't. On Archer, you request the number of nodes. So you have to remember there's 24 cores per node. So if you did that, hash PBS minus L select equals 32, AP RAM minus N32, my job, you would actually be requesting 32 nodes. You'll be allocated 32 nodes with 768 cores, but you don't be running on 32 nodes. So you'd run on the first node, which is 24 cores, and a third of the second node, and eight cores of the, of the second node. The other 30 nodes would go totally unused, but you would be charged for them. So this is a, this. So it's very. You will be charged for effectively 24 times what you thought you were, you were be you were asking for. It's very important. So on, on Archer, and this is a change from the, the previous Cray systems. On the modern Cray systems, at request time you tell PBS how many nodes you want, and it's up to you to remember that the number of cores you get is 24 times that. On the old systems, you requested the number of cores, and it, 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 it worked out the number of nodes. That was complicated, though, because how many nodes you want kind of depends on what you want to do, and are you doing MPI, open MP? Do you really want to fully populate the nodes? It got very complicated. So they take the, the correct decision on the current Cray, which is you request the number of nodes you want, but it's up to you to remember the number of cores you get is 24 times that. We've seen people blowing their budgets because they've been, you know, actually using many more nodes than they, uh, um, uh, yeah, paying for many more nodes than they thought they were. However, um, you are only charged for the amount of time your job ran. So if you, if, you, if you request two hours of time and your job takes five minutes, you're only charged for five minutes. But your job would have been killed at the two-hour limit. So you're charged for all the nodes, whether you use them or not, but you're only charged for the time that you act, your job was resident. So, that's, so the, the advantage of specifying a small wall clock time is purely to allow your job to be scheduled efficiently. It doesn't actually affect how much you're charged. Um, so that's really quite quite straightforward, uh, sorry, I don't know if it's straightforward, but hope that's sort of um, all I wanted to say about classic sort of um, fairly standard AP run usage, PBS usage on, on, on Archer. I'm now going to talk a bit, about, a bit more about AP run, which is actually more sophisticated than you might think, but are there any questions at that point? I think it's the file system thing which, which sometimes confuses people. Any questions at all about how it um, how it works? Okay, well I'll carry on, and you're welcome to ask questions at, at the end. But yeah, talk reasonably on time. So AP Run is surprisingly um, sophisticated. As I said, once PBS decides your job is going to run. It um, allocates you these compute nodes, and your bat script is executed on the mom nodes. And the way that the, your bat script on the mom nodes launches parallel jobs on the compute nodes is via AP Run. But AP Run is actually like a mini scheduler. So you don't have to, now most of the time, if you request 144 cores, you want to use them. But there's a number of situations, well, there's some things you can do. If you want to run three, three, job, three instances of your job, on data set one, data set two, and data set three, it's probably better. Oh, so someone asked that. Uh, right, if someone's asked GNK, if the wall time is, I have said is one hour and my program runs for 10 minutes, I will be charged only for 10 minutes. Yes, you are only charged for the time you, that your job runs for. However, your job will have been, if your job ran for an hour and 10 minutes, it will be cut at an hour and you'll be charged for that hour and it's, it's kind of your fault you didn't get the right answer. Uh, but the advantage of trying to set the runtime close, the wall time close to your real runtime, is it will be scheduled more efficiently. So assuming that your job, yeah, you are only charged the amount of time your program runs for, but that is that is cut, that is that is cut at the wall clock time. But yes, the question you've asked is correct. If you set one hour run, uh, one hour wall time, when you run for ten minutes, you're only charged for ten minutes. So like if your job fails very very early on, then um, and exits, then you don't get charged. But if you want to run three jobs, it's rather than submitting three Q subs, which is kind of three jobs going into the queue, and there's a bit of a latency there, there's nothing to stop you doing three AP runs. So, so if you want to process data set one, data set two, and data set three, you just AP run minus N144. Um, 
is there some way to get quick view on what raw CSI I'm actually using as opposed to what I thought I was requesting? Um, um, there is, well, first of all, um, you just sort of should be, by default, um, you, can, you should sort of be careful and check that your um, AP run is on. Uh, okay, so Claire's saying, because there is a way of getting it to print out how much you were charged. And is that is that what the Q start minus F does, Claire? Um, that, that, that was what I was going to suggest. There's a way of, of, I can't remember exactly how you do it, but there's a way, oh, uh, it tells you what nodes are being used. Oh, okay, right, okay. So that's, so, so while your job is running, I presume, Okay, that's that's very useful. Q stat minus F. Okay, thanks, Claire. That's very useful. So Q stat minus F on a running job will tell you what's actually being used. Okay, great. So um, the the most so the, the first thing that people think is that you can only do one AP run within a PBS job. You can't. You can do multiple AP runs. So as long as you request enough time to do three runs of your job, you can do AP run, uh, AP run, AP runs. So that can be useful for quicker turnaround. However, you, AP Run is actually, oops, I've lost my focus here. AP Run is actually quite clever. AP Run is like a mini, mini scheduler. So AP Run will manage jobs within this window, within this allocation. So if you were um, allocated 144 cores with minus L select equals 6, AP Run could run multiple jobs within that. So in print, it will allow you to run a 72 core job and another 72 job, core job alongside each other. So what, what you might think is do this, AP Ram and SN72, my program. Um, so my, my chat window is a bit small, so I, I have to scroll to see what the, um, what the questions are, which is a bit unfortunate. That's OK. Oh yeah, yeah. Claire's just saying that. Yeah, if you have a chain of jobs, yeah. Sorry. So, um, AP Run is capable of running uh, multiple jobs in subsets of um, of the reservation. But what I've typed here won't work because AP Run um, it blocks. AP Run blocks until it finishes. So what this would do is it would run a job in half your reservation. And then it finished, it would run another job in the halfway reservation. To, to get AP Run to schedule multiple jobs within a, a, an enclosing reservation, you need to have multiple AP Runs running at once. So you put them in the background. So what you say is, this is incorrect, all these will run sequentially. The next thing people do is they do this. They put them in the background. So you do ampersand, OK? That looks great. So AP Run launches a job on 72 cores. Then the next AP Run could launch another set of jobs on 72. And then you do another two, and what the next two will do is they will queue up an AP run would say, uh, well, um, uh, uh, this, the, the, all 144 cores are being used, so I'll wait. The problem with this is, this is incorrect, because your, the, your job, your PBS job finishes when your script finishes. And what's happening here is that, um, that, that basically these are all launched in the background, your script comes to the end, falls off the end, the script finishes and your job is killed. So um, you want to run multiple AP, AP runs at once, but you don't want them all to run. You, you want to stop the script kind of falling off the end and finishing, OK? So this is a bit of a problem. So the next thing people do is they do this. Well, I'll run the first three in the background, and I'll leave the final one as a, as a, as a blocking one. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, that's not going to work either. Because the script finishes when data set four finishes, but other data sets may still be running at the same time. So if I imagine data set one is really, really difficult, AP ROM and I send 72 MP, my MP program data set one is running, then you run data set two, that fills up the other half, but it's quick. So then you run data set three, and then data set four, that might finish, then your job is finished because the AP run, the script finishes when the final AP run finishes, and then everything's, everything's uh, killed. So my hand waving is a bit funny because I can't get to grips with the fact this isn't a mirror. You've got my left, left and right are being screwed up. So what you do, if you want to run multiple AP runs in the background, you do this. You, run, you spawn them all off in the background, and then you issue a magic command, which is wait. And wait is a, 
a units command which says wait until all background processes have completed. So this is saying do not this stops your script from falling off the bottom. It sits there waiting for the background jobs to finish. And this is really this can be very useful because it um, because it allows you if you want to run lots of smallish jobs. Um, you can basically request a large number of cores and, and, and run lots of them. And in some sense, AP Run is like a mini scheduler. So you know, there's a hierarchy. PBS has control of the entire machine and allocates your subset of nodes. And then within that subset of nodes, AP Run is able to allocate the, those, those nodes to, to your MP, those cores to your MPI job. So this is correct. So this can be quite a useful thing to do. Uh, and so, if you have something like a, a, a task farm, you can you can run task farms using AP Run. So, for example, you know what might happen here: the order might be the first one might run, the second one might run. AP Run, you're then asking for 72 cores, but you don't have 72 free stack queues. But AP Run will then immediately run the, the, the fourth one because well, he's got 36 left over. So, AP Run is really quite clever. If you have multiple AP Runs running at once, they're all they will all be scheduled uh, to, to try and maximize use of your of your reservation. So these might run one, two, th four, three, five. They don't even have to run in the order you, you submit them. So um, you might say why can my, well what some people are, don't understand why in their job script they can they can see a file but the MPI programs can't. You know, we do minus minus ls minus l input dot that it exists. Then you run your MPI program. Your MPI program says can't open input dot that. That happens if the input input dot that is on the home file system because the script runs on the mom rows which can see slash home, but MPI runs on the compute nodes which you only see slash work. So you know, do not run PBS jobs at least parallel PBS jobs that launch parallel programs from anywhere other than the work file system. However, there is a trick. You can store your MPI executables in slash home. So you might say, well, that's weird, because if I, you said that I launched an MPI program, it then complained because it couldn't see input dot dat, because input dot dat was on slash home. But why was my MPI program even be able to run in the first place? Because if the MPI program sits on slash home, how can it be executed on the compute nodes? Because you said the compute nodes can't see slash home. Well, the important point is AP run broadcast the executable. It's actually a bit confused. By default, AP run broadcast the executable. So, so the mom nodes, which can see slash home, take a copy of it and broadcast it over the network to the compute nodes. Once they're running, they're not able to see uh, the, the home file system. So uh, that, that's why you can run an MPI job from the slash home file system. But if it does any file I.O., that will fail. So you can run MPI jobs from slash home if you don't do any input or output, but that's pretty unusual. How, now, you may have heard of interactive jobs. How do interactive job batch jobs work? Well, you're effectively submitting a job which runs a bash shell on the mom nodes. Effectively, what happens is an interactive job gives you back a, 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 an X term, a window, or you can type interactive commands into it. And what's actually happening is the job is just is running on the mom nodes, and you're getting back uh, a shell. And you'll see, actually, you're logged into the mom nodes. Your, your prompt will be mom3 or something like that. And that's actually a useful way for debugging um, scripts. If you have a little script and you think what's well, quite complicated, does lots of setup, pre and post processing, runs an MPI job, then does a bit more, a bit more. If you want to test if that works, you could, st you could, you could set it to run for a short time by having a very maybe, maybe short runtime in the MPI job. And and if you if you queue sub that job and it fails, it might take a few hours to run. Comes back, you've made a trivial error. You correct it. You queue sub it again. A couple of hours later, you get another trivial error. That's very very annoying. What you can do is you can sub submit an interactive job, and the man pages show you how to do that. You'll be logged onto the mom nodes, and you can just run your scripts, and the AP runs will execute correctly because you're on a mom node and that allows you if there's a mistake to immediately re-edit the script and then resubmit again. So interactive jobs are useful for doing very quick turnaround and useful for debugging because you can do AP run, recompile, AP run, recompile, but they're also useful for debugging scripts, batch scripts, PBS scripts. So I mentioned there were some special queues um, and I said some systems compile um, control 
all the access via queues, there'll be a, a, a one-hour queue, a two-hour queue, a three-hour queue, a four-hour queue. We don't not have to do that. We have set a single queue, and you specify what your requirements are. But there are some special queues. Uh, regular jobs go into the regular queue, and the regular queue, which is where most jobs run, is up to 24 hours, which is up to all the nodes on the system, almost 5,000, which is up to almost 120,000 cores. Long jobs, which is Q sub minus Q long, is up to 48 hours, but only on 100, up, to, um, up to 256 nodes, which is um, just over 6,000 cores. So we do support, allow you to submit jobs which are longer than 24 hours, but only on just up to 6,000 cores. Short jobs can be very useful for debugging. Uh, this used to be, I think, it actually used to be called the debug queue. It's now called the short queue. Q sub minus Q short. It's a maximum of 20 minutes. It's only up to eight nodes, which is normally enough for debugging. But it's only available nine to five, Monday to Friday. So um, uh, if you submit a job outside of that time, it won't be killed. It will be. It will be rejected. It will be queued. So it can be a bit confusing. But but. 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 UK time, if you're not a UK resident, Monday to Friday, there's this short queue, which is quite useful for, for debugging uh, little jobs. There's also a low priority queue, Q sub minus Q low. This is up to three hours on 512 nodes. Um, it's uncharged, so this is actually for sort of um, uh, hoovering up on new cycles. But it's only enabled when the machine is very lightly used. So there's no guaranteed job submitted with no priority will ever run. They could, they could take a long time. I don't actually know what the what the turnaround time is for, for, for jobs in the low priority queue. As I said, it, it is uncharged time because it's free, but you're, you're, you're very much at the bottom of the pile. And if the machine is is anything other, is moderately or highly used, then the, the, um, the low priority queue won't be enabled. Serial jobs, Q sub minus Q serial, these are separate pre and post processing nodes. Um, so if you want to do very heavy pre and post processing, you should not do it in your batch script, which runs on the mom nodes. You should not do it on the, on, in your batch script for two reasons. One, the mom nodes are um, not particularly high powered and they're shared with other users. So if you hammer them for doing pre and post processing, you are, um, um, you are, uh, interact affecting other users' jobs, but the main thing is that all the time you're doing serial, um, you know, bookkeeping pre and post processing in your batch script, you're paying for the parallel nodes which are, which are sitting there idle. So if you want to do heavy pre and post processing, you should use these serial. That there are a separate high memory post -pro pre and post processing nodes. Using them is not entirely trivial, trivial because they have a slightly different architecture from the compute nodes, so compiling for them is slightly different options. But, but if you are doing heavy pre and post processing, uh, you should submit jobs to the serial queue. Someone's asked, why isn't the short queue available out of this frame, out of this time chain? Yeah, that's, we have, that's, um, that's, um, I have been hit by that myself. I mean, the problem is that, um, obviously, if you're, when you're in the development phase, uh, you would really like access to the short queue outside of nine to five. However, uh, Archer has to be there to um, to process very very big jobs, and um, running short small jobs gets in the way of that. The machine get kind of fragmented. So you know, from five in the evening till nine in the morning, the idea is um, Archer is processing the really really big jobs and getting them done. Um, yeah, so. That, that's why it's not enabled. Um, yeah. So as, as, as it, it's kind of this jog fragmentation which can be a problem that a little job might only use a small amount of, of, of resource, but it can it can inadvertently block a very big job from running. So um, you can submit a query if you want. I mean. Um, yeah, but there's lots of people running eight node jobs, and it can, yeah. Um, I mean, it, I there must be a a way I can I can raise that. I mean, I I did ask this question before, and I was given the answer, so I've only explained it in very generic terms as to why the the the, the general idea is what I was saying, and what Claire pointed out that it, the 
that, that actually it may be surprising these short jobs can kind of fragment the system and I mean that that in although in practice you think you can you, you, you can run a big job various limitations mean that you can't um, and this is what we've agreed but I mean it, we can if there was a big user demand for for, for, for um, extending that time I mean, it could principally be looked at, but at, but at the moment, that's seen as the best balance between development and and um, and production. Um, so, could you take a note of that, Claire? Just I'll, I'll, I mean, I, I just just check. Uh, sometimes it's also limitations in PBS. I mean, you might say, well, in principle, why can't this be done? But in practice, uh, PBS is maybe uh, has problems. Okay. Ah, so my, can you, yes, so you can specify dependencies in PBS, and I, off the top of my head, I don't know how to do it, but, um, well, there's two ways of doing this. Um, one is you could submit multiple jobs with dependencies and say you've got job A, job B, job C, A is pre-processing, B is uh, production C is post processing. You would say you would submit A, B, C, where you would say B depends on A and C depends on B. So that would create a chain. The other thing you could do, but it's a bit less elegant, a bit more dangerous, is to queue sub a job at the end of your batch script. The reason that is slightly dangerous is that if you don't, it's quite easy to get into a a loop where the job spins and keeps resubmitting itself. So you could have you could have a pre-processing job A, which Q sub job B, and the end of job B you Q sub job C. But I would I would um, uh, advise um, very much uh, using the PBS job dependencies. I don't know off the top of my head how to do it. Um, uh, if I could pick up a browser. If I if I can maybe you should not be seeing a browser, I don't know if it's legible, but um Okay, so I did the Google, I meant to do a Google on, uh, yeah. Job chain, right, right. And then it's probably something on the Archer website. I meant to, I meant, meant to search on the Archer website, but oh, deprecated, please see new documentation. No, okay, that wasn't very useful. It uh, served me right for trying to. Uh, Ah, oh, there it is. Yes, so the dot 4.4.2 using PPS job dependencies. Yes, so it's um, so hopefully you can see. Can someone just confirm you can see this browser? I, I switched to to exporting the browser window, but I sometimes have difficulty with. So can you see a browser? Yeah, fine. So PPS job for yeah uh, minus W depend equals after. OK of this job. So it says, I want to run submit.pbs after this job finishes OK. That's, yeah, fine. OK, so, that, that's, um, so that, that, that's doable now. That, that's exactly how I'd recommend doing, the, um, doing the, um, the job dependencies. The only thing I would say, I don't know if this is an issue, but I always have this problem that I, my scripts just tend to fall off the end. Um, and then they can have a random return code. So technically, it's possible that a, a script can complete, but but report an error because you haven't because you haven't specifically exited with a, a non-zero error status. It might exit with a random error status, which is which is uh, sorry, which is which is non-zero. Sorry, and then PBS might think, oh, that job, that script. But you need to be careful. This is a few other gotchas. I've so you need to be careful to do things cleanly. But that's um, uh, that's the way to assume. I've not used it. My mine's W depend equals. That's quite nice actually. Um, okay, so I will go back to the presentation. 
Um, so I've done the special cues. I hope you should see the slides again. Oh, that was the end. Okay, so. Um, I thought I had. Sorry, I, meant, I, I was a slide. I thought that. So I've been through all these. Sorry, I'm just concerned. I skipped one slide. Oh, this this bit. Sorry, this was the one. Yeah. The two things which get confusing, and hopefully that um, uh, why can my job script see my home files, but my MPI program would see my work files? In other words, um, and why can I store my MPI execute from the hash home, not, not its input files? That's because A, uh, the compute nodes can't see uh, the home file system, and then the quite obvious question that comes already, how was I able to run the job in the first place? Well, that's because AP run actually takes it by default, at least, takes copy or executable. Um, the only other thing I should put on these slides is um, the error message you get from PBS and, and such like are normally relatively um, uh, instructive. However, if you omit the minus L select, so if you, if you submit a PBS job but forget to request a a certain number of nodes, you get the most bizarre error message, which ends with "Please contact your system administrator." So that is the um, um, that that is a, I should put that in. That is the classic um, difficult to debug error. If you, if you do a queue sub and you get some bizarre error message back telling you to contact the system administrator, then uh, the first thing to do is to check that you've done minus L select equals whatever. That, that's, that, that caught me out on a course once and made me look rather stupid. So um, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions at all? I mean, about anything to do with the Archer service, PBS, but anything at all, um, we can try and ask them or, or store them up for later if we can't answer them live. Ah, the RDF. Okay, so the RDF is the research data facility. So, well, the RDF is, 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 is I should have, okay, so I only had the file systems on there which were relevant for, um, uh, for, for running parallel jobs. The RDF is a much larger, um, the RDF is a much larger storage system which I believe is of order 20 petabytes as opposed to five. And it's for longer term archiving. So slash work is, is fast and therefore quite expensive. And if you just want to, you know, store um, if you want to store data, um, if you want to reuse slash work, uh, slash work is there to be read and written from the compute nodes. But if you want to just analyze data offline, you should copy it to the RDF. And there's two reasons why that is true. A, the RDF is much bigger and therefore um, cheaper, but B, the RDF uh, has a lifetime longer than Archer. The slash works file system on Archer is tied to Archer, so in three or four years or whenever the Archer service ends, slash work will end. But the RDF is funded separately, so it's a persistent storage which will live between, uh, between services. Um, there is also, uh, to do data analysis on the RDF, there's also a a small cluster called the data analytics cluster, and we are just um, we are just put that into production. So the documentation for that is um, just appearing, but we are running a course. Hopefully in March, um, it will appear on the list very soon, telling you how to effectively use the RDF. It will be called data storage and management on Archer, but it will focus on um, two things. One is getting good file I/O to from slash work, and the other is how to manage your data, including using the RDF. And then, yes, a very important, as Claire says, um, the home file system is backed up and it's very small. The, RD, the, the work system is, is pretty big and, and very, very high performance, but it's not backed up. The RDF is backed up, all 20 petabytes of it. So, but slash work is not backed up. So, you know, you should not, the th I, I said you shouldn't keep stuff on long-term on slash work because it was, 
um, using up the precious slash workspace, but more important, as Claire has pointed out, it is not guaranteed to be safe, whereas the RDF is backed up for disaster recovery. So we had another question there, which was, the jobs may take longer than 48, is there any snapshot restart functionality built in? No, there isn't. And um, the reason is, excuse me, um, it's, it's very difficult. Um, oh, yes, as Claire is saying. And so this, this is the kind of thing we'll try and cover in the course. But um, um, moving lots of small files can be slow, but, but moving one large file is much quicker. So there, 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 there are some. We are developing the documentation right now, but that, that is a critical thing. Um, one large file rather than lots of small files. The snap, it's very difficult to take a snapshot of a running job because it is running across multiple operating systems. Each compute node is a separate Linux operating system. So although a running Unix job can be um, snapshotted with, con well, you can suspend it with Control Z effectively and restart it. Uh, you can dump that image to disk. That is very difficult to do across multiple operating systems. You would have to make sure there were no uh, messages in flight over the network. Now, that is in principle possible, um, but um, and I, I don't that I don't believe it's implemented on 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 Archer. The other reason, sorry, it's, I don't believe it's even possible on Archer. The other reason it's not a good idea is that um, a computer node on Archer has uh, 64 gigabytes of memory. Uh, if you do an automatic OS snapshot, it will it will dump and save all the memory, all the data which is being used by your program. But you, in any real program, 95% of the data is, is 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 temporary scratch data. You know that you know at the start of each time step. Although in 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 the middle of a time set, you may have lots of data. At the start of each time step, you have a data set which you could save. So user driven checkpointing saves the minimum of data. OS checkpointing has to save all the data which is there. And IO on Archer is, is slow. So um, you're lucky if you get a few gigabytes per second. So it could take hours to automatically checkpoint a job. So no, there is not any automatic checkpoint restart um, for a couple of technical reasons. Well, a technical reason, which is that it's difficult to, to suspend multiple conjoined running processes. But practically, um, they typically, will be dumping way too much data, and that would that would be very slow. Do libraries on Archer automatically thread? It depends on the library. Um, so um, that's a, it depends on the library. So for example, if you're using the Blas library, maybe for doing or Laypack library. Uh, you need to check. Um, it's a difficult thing because you don't necessarily always want to thread. So I think the the, 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 the rationale on Archer would be that by default, they probably don't thread. The reason is if you're running 24 processes on a node, and you've got one process per node, and you call a library, you don't want it to thread because the, you, know, you, want it to use, you don't want it to thread because then you'll get each. If it automatically used all the cores that were available, you'd have 24 processes, each spawning 24 threads, which is 24 squared, whatever that is, 590, 576, whatever it is, threads, which is going to swamp the system. So uh, you, uh, you should not assume that libraries thread. There, you know, any threaded library should be able to run in threaded in, using threads on Archer. But um, I think the general rationale is to is not to want them to thread automatically because that is typically messes the majority of users up. So it does depend on the library. Um, also on Archer with threading, it can be quite if you're going to do, if you're going to have a combination of process and thread parallelism, uh, you need to be you need to be quite clever with your AP run because the um, um, 
you, the way the threads are scheduled to the cores is, is under your control, but the default is probably not what you want. So, so the um, the binding of threads, the binding of if you're going to use multi-threaded applications, the binding of processes and threads to cores becomes quite critical. Um, so. And that can all be controlled with AP Run, but it, you need to just check you know what you're doing. So if you wanted to do that, it might be worth sending an email to the help desk. Um, we could give you some advice. Okay. Um, is there an easy straight order way to compile a code with the Craig compiler earlier by Intel? I would expect the Craig compiled code performs better. Well, um, it's not necessarily true that Craig compiled code performs better because we are they are Intel chips, and it doesn't matter what compiler you use, you will be using the same MPI library. Um, so, so the MPI performance is, isn't dependent on the compiler. So you, you will be getting optimal MPI performance regardless of what compiler you use. Um, uh, and, and but they are Intel chips, and so the Intel compiler activity does a pretty good job. Um, the Cray compiler might be really all I can say is you know the uh, unhelpful but um, party line is that a, a C compliant or Fortran compliant code should um, should compile under any compiler. Um, <laughs> that's not a particularly useful statement, but um, what I would do is is um, um, just, I mean, just try it with the default options. Just, 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 you, you know, just do uh, FTN or CC uh, and and see what happens. And then any any issues should be. Well, the, the the important thing to realize is that although the, the Archer uses these um, compiler wrappers, it doesn't matter whether you are using. Uh, GNU, Intel, or, or Cray compilers, they're always invoked with the same command, which is CC or FTN, or, or um, capital CC for, for C++. Although they're generic wrappers that map to specific instances, the compile flags are clearly different. So um, the first thing to do is you would have to, if you wanted to, if you had a make file for, for the Intel compiler and wanted to move to the Cray compiler, the first thing you'd have to do is to probably omit all the Intel specific compiler flags, of which there may be quite a few. And then, if there are critical ones there to do with vectorization or such like, which, which improve the performance, you need to um, start introducing them into the Cray compiler. Um, to be honest, the biggest difference we see, the, the, the biggest thing that people say is, you know, the Cray compiler typically will, might give it a lot better performance than the GNU compiler. That's often, big, and that is probably true, but a large amount of the effect is because the Cray compiler by default has very high compiler optimization, where the GNU compiler by default has very low optimization. So often, if someone tells you the Cray compiler is faster than the Intel compiler, it might be that you can find some flags on the Intel compiler which should get you close to that performance, because maybe the Cray compiler by default is more aggressive for vectorization or something. The Intel compiler isn't. There, this, there is um, information in the documentation about about the best um, default options. But I, you know, moving compilers between different moving codes between different compilers is easy if the code is complies to the standard and the compiler is a bug free. But other than that, it, it is a bit of an art. So no, unfortunately, there isn't an easy way. Other than you have to get rid of the Intel comp Intel compiler specific flags um, and just try and compile it. You know, with no flags, and then build up. Sorry if that wasn't particularly useful. Debugging any way to attach an interactive job to an MPI process. So you can run the. Um, so the typical way we would do this is actually to submit. Um, it's a bit complicated, but for example, for, for supported applications like. Um, DDT, which is the graphical debugger, there is a way of launching it where you sort of do DDT, AP, run, whatever, and then it will know to attach, the, to, it, will, it will then launch AP, run under DDT, and, and DDT will then be able to connect through to the running processes. Attaching a, a debugger to a running job, I believe is possible, but I've never done it. You need to look at the, I think that's possible, but it's it's not 
it's not trivial. Um, that is a good question. I should know the answer to that, but I don't. The only way I've ever run debuggers on Archer is right from the start, say, I want to launch this parallel program under a debugger. So you effectively do DDT AP run my MPI program and configure it in a way that DDT knows not to debug AP run, but to debug the, the spawned MPI program. But actually saying um, my job's hung, for example, and I want to. I my work okay so if you've launched a batch job and then you launch an interactive job and try and con connect the batch job from the interactive job I doubt it will let you I would think they would be sort of in different realms I mean in principle it can check your user ID but um, I think the only way to do it is first of all you have to launch your MPI job from an interactive session. So uh, and then um, I need to speak to um, Adrian Jackson, who's the one who configured the DD to Adrian or, or Andy. Um, but specifically, you're asking how to do debugging. You would launch DDT from an interactive session. Uh, right from the start, but if if the, if the job is already running, you want to connect to it. I have to say, I don't know the answer to that. So I'll see if I can find out. Claire, sorry, I don't have a. I, I'm running out of screens here. Could you take a note of that, uh, along with the, the time limits for the short queue? That I should speak. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that's all the questions. I don't think I missed any. Um, so I was going to probably leave in about five minutes, but are there any final questions people wanted to to um, to ask? So I hope you found that useful. As I said, I'll put the um, I'll put the slides up um, immediately after the session as PDFs. 